Okay, so recall last time, uh, we, as you said, we gave analytic continuation. So we have this L chi S. Yes. Uh, thanks. Please do remind me because if I forget, then that's not good. We gave uh, analytic continuation and functional equation as S goes to one minus S and chi goes to chi bar. Um, and a key ingredient here was uh, the inverse Fourier transform, finite Fourier transform that chi of n is a sum, uh, there's this normalization factor one over root q, a sum over m mod q, chi hat of m e sub q of minus n m, which uh, if chi is primitive, if chi is primitive, then this vanishes if M is not co-prime to Q, so I can put a prime there. And, uh, and for the co-prime values, this is equal to chi of M bar times chi hat of one, chi hat of one, and chi hat of one is the Gauss sum of chi divided by root Q. Where did okay. you learn this treatment? Um, I, it I mean, it's the standard treatment, but this way of presenting it, I, I, I haven't seen other places. I, uh, I'm sure it exists. I just. This is like the bumps one, it's just slightly more annoying than this one. Like the... Yeah. <laughs> you know, every, every time you read somebody's treatment, you should say, that person's a complete idiot. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. Dearslay is a fool. What the hell does Riemann know? I'll figure it out my way. And then you realize, uh, no, my, I'm, I'm the idiot. Everyone's the the guy with the with the good ideas and okay, how'd you do it? You know, but you should you shouldn't just give in to them. You should fight them and try to find your way. And uh, you know, someone's gonna read this, and and then they'll read bump and they'll say, oh, bump treatment is so much better. Why well, you know the city of Kantorovich? What the hell is he doing? So it's all uh, uh, to each their own. That's sort of the beauty of of the subject. As long as it's correct, right? It's, uh... Yeah, we're all doing the same thing. Um, anyway, so if we put all of this together, we get one over Q uh, with a tau with a Gauss sum, tau of chi, which we showed was uh, had absolute value root Q last time. And then uh, a sum over M mod Q, we can still put the prime there, although now it's really not needed because uh, it, it'll die anyway. And then E sub q of minus n m. And then there's one last thing you can do, which is to replace uh, m by negative m, just to make this slightly nicer. And that will pull out a chi of negative one if I replace m by negative m. So I have a chi of negative one, yeah. tau of chi over q, a sum over m mod q co prime, chi of m e of q n m, just to make it slightly Slightly more good. Okay, and this all of this was equal to chi of n. And so, what I want to get to is how would you discover Dirichlet's class number form if you didn't know it already? How could you figure out that something like this should be true? And for me, it's all pattern matching. So let's look how to discover for the series. Uh... Yeah, how to discover so. My guess is that this is something that Dirichlet went through. And he did uh, a lot of pattern matching back then. Oh yeah. There were like tons of calculations. Everything was what we now would call experimental math, right. which is just called math. <laughs> if you experiment, you do a whole bunch of examples, you find a pattern, you find the reason why that pattern is true, and then you prove it, and there's your theorem. Right. right? right. So this is, uh, for some reason, something new these days when, when it's existed for thousands used to be uh, the way to do uh, it, it, science exactly <laughs> uh class number formula class number formula so let's try to understand l of one chi sometimes i put the chi as an under, underscore it's all the same thing um well what is it if you just naively wrote out what it's supposed to be it's chi of n over n to the one all right well this doesn't converge um, absolutely. absolutely, but it does converge conditionally. This conditionally converges. Right, non-trivial. Right, converges. Uh, 
even for s equals one, uh, because the partial sums, so if we look at the partial sums, let's call this function f of x or something, n up to x chi of n, what do we know about the growth rate of this function? It's like constant, right? Exactly, it's bounded, yep, it's constant. Okay, so, so we're, I mean, it's bounded by q, and q is the conductor, q is fixed. Exactly, you sum up uh, the numbers from zero to q, you get to zero. You sum up the next q, you get to zero. You never, you never get bigger than q. Um, all right. So it conditionally converges. But let's uh, let's go back to the 19th century, I guess, and uh, and pretend that we can reverse orders. So if we can reverse orders, I'm going to stick in this formula for chi. So I haven't justified this, but let's just move on anyway. So it's a sum over n, and I'm going to put all this stuff in. So let's put all this stuff in. It's chi of negative one tau of chi over q, a sum over. There's a finite sum m co prime to q chi of m bar. And then uh, this is the only thing that has an n in it. So now I want to sum as n goes from one to infinity, e to the two pi i over q and m over n. I'm just replacing oh. chi of n. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, you're just like subbing in. I'm just subbing this in and interchanging right. where I'm technically not allowed to and you have to be a little careful. Heuristic. This is a heuristic kind of calculation which can be made precise. Uh, I, but I want to do the, I don't want to take the time to make it precise. I want to go straight to the calculation. How could you compute these things and hope that I mean, this is really the kind of thing where, where things go wrong, where you're where you have conditionally convergent series and you're, you're interchanging, yeah, around. you're swapping orders. Like this is exactly where you're not supposed to uh, do this, but in this case, it turns out. But you could think that back then, this is the kind of thing that, that would get done. You know, you do all the heuristics and see if you get anything nice, right? Right. So it's like, yeah. Right, right, exactly. So, so what does this look like? So it's like, uh, you know, z plus z squared over two plus z cubed over three and so on where z is where z is e to the two pi i kind of exactly m over q exactly this is log this is negative log of one minus z now this again this converges also let's think about this log this series converges as long as z is an absolute value less than one it converges absolutely yes. less than or equal to one it converges as long as z is not equal to one exactly. okay so so this is the region so it kind of a... exactly it's, yeah, yeah. okay and and if you look at one minus z so if i said w equal to one minus z well one minus z if i have a point z somewhere here minus z is over here and one minus z i've shifted the whole circle over so in the w plane uh, w takes values here, and of course I can't evaluate log at zero, but I can evaluate log at all these other places. Yeah, now this thing's going to pop up. Um, let's do that and you can, that. You can figure out the spotlight thing. No, oh. I also can't figure out how to get rid of it to move it over. Okay, ah, oh, that's good. Now it's really out of the way. Okay, all right. So does that make sense so far? So this is negative log of one minus uh well let me just write it z because it's a little little complicated but this so this is the complex log let's be let's be a little careful about which log i mean the complex log by which i should take a branch cut right what is the complex log complex log take the standard one. i'll take the standard branch cut which means if i write w if i can write w as some real number times e to the i theta, then the log should be the, the usual log, the real log of the norm of w uh, plus i theta, where theta, where theta is the argument. Right. The argument and you're letting it be from yes, plus pi thank to you. minus pi? This is in, let's do it like this, with theta having absolute value. Yeah, so theta ranges from minus pi to plus pi. Okay. In fact, in this ball, theta ranges from pi over two to minus pi over two. Right. At worst. Okay. All right. 
So, um, so let's do a little bit of geometry. Question. I think that this is sufficient to, to show that you can interchange the sums, right? Because you have a finite sum, and then inside you have a limiting process, but you prove that the limit, the limit works. That's exactly what you would do to make this precise. Yes. No, I mean this is precise. Uh, when you when you've added those words to the argument, yes, which I haven't, but but now you have, so so it is. <laughs> Um, because the outer sum is a finite one, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, but it's still reordering. It's but all those limits exist on the right. All those limits do exist. And if you have, you know, a sum of limits that exist, you can, the limit of the sum also exists. Uh, yes. Yes, but we're reordering. So just because if if a limit conditionally exists, and you start reordering that that limit. You start reordering the terms. So each of these has been ordered in a particular way. It's been grouped in a particular way. And each of these has been grouped in a particular yeah, no, way. No, I understand, but uh, yeah, but the grouping now, yeah, it's a finite sum. The yeah. Be yeah. Verified. Okay. So again, this is Z. This is Z. Let's think about the angle of Z. Let's call it the angle of Z um, alpha or something. Okay, so negative z has this angle. This is also alpha. And when I slide it over to one minus z, so where is that like, like here ish or something? So this is w, which is one minus z. Yes, yes. Uh, this angle is alpha. And so what is this length? What is the length of w? The length of w, I have this triangle, which has length. Side length one, one, and angle alpha. So I can use, uh, what is it? Uh, C squared is A squared plus B squared minus two A B uh, cosine, cosine, the law of cosine, cosine <laughs> of, of C. So I'm going to use the law of cosines here. Norm of W squared is C. A squared is one. B squared is one. So this is A, this is B, minus two A B cosine of alpha. Okay. Yeah, we're about to do a little bit of, uh, you know, trig or something. Um, so this is just two minus two cos alpha. And there's a there's a simple uh, a simplification of this. So let's see if I can get this right. Cosine of um, a double. I want to use a double angle formula. Two. Uh, I don't know what. Uh, eta or something is cos squared minus sine squared which is also one minus uh, two sine squared, right? And so if I now replace, in other words, cosine of two alpha, this is two minus two times cosine of alpha is one minus two sine squared of alpha over two. If I, if I replace eta by, uh, Two eta is alpha. Okay, and the nice thing about this is the twos cancel, and I'm just left with plus four sine squared alpha over two. Here, everybody, yeah, two minus two cosine alpha. And that's the length of W squared. So you'll be able to root it. So I'll be able to take the square root. I get two sine alpha. Now, alpha, um, alpha, uh, we can think of alpha as being positive. Alpha can be a pi. You see, uh, theta is the angle that needs to be at most pi, but alpha we can think of as going like this. So alpha, this angle alpha, can range in zero to uh, two pi. It means this is not going to be the argument. Of well, it, so in other words, m, m can range from zero to q. In this sum, this sum at first, this sum is just a sum in m mod z. Right. So I don't, I'm not telling you what value of m to choose. But now if I want to do these calculations and keep track of the actual branch cuts, I need to choose a value. And I'll choose m to run from 0 to q so that alpha runs from 0 to 2 pi. So that sine alpha, in fact, uh, yeah, so that... Uh, well, I can just put absolute values. It doesn't really matter. Um, 
the point is that now w so 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 what have we got we've got that the norm of w is two let's say absolute value of sine of alpha over two okay just from taking screws fine how about theta well theta the theta of w is here theta how do we figure out what theta is This triangle is isosceles. That's also theta. Should I zoom in? Oh, right, right, right. Okay. okay. <laughs> so now we have theta, theta, alpha. Way simpler, this is what this this turns out to be simpler. Um, so what do we know about theta? Theta plus theta plus alpha is pi. This is isosceles. Here. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so what's theta? It's pi minus alpha over two. Okay. So this log, this log, this complex log, is equal to the real log, the usual log of uh, two. Let's put it absolute value two sine of alpha over two plus i theta, and theta is pi minus alpha over 2. And uh, wait, what was alpha originally? And alpha is uh, 2 pi m over q. And alpha is 2 pi m over q. And m ranges from 0 to q, so alpha ranges from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, so let's let's substitute that in. Alpha is equal to uh, what do we say? Two pi m over q, and so we get so so now now we can put everything together. Oh, and all you're doing is that you're literally pulling the argument out of uh, out of this eq and um, right? exactly the, okay. exactly. I want to evaluate this exactly. Okay, so it's a finite sum. So l one chi. Let's put it all together. L one chi is equal to. There's a minus sign from the minus log, and a chi of minus one and a tau of chi over q, minus chi of minus one tau of chi over q, a sum over m mod q co prime or not doesn't matter because I'm putting a chi m bar. And then each of those is met with this log, and the log we have evaluated. The log is this. The complex log is the real log of two sine of alpha over two, which is pi m over q, plus i times pi minus alpha over two. So pi minus alpha is um, pi minus alpha, pi minus alpha is uh, q pi. Let's see, I want to pull out a pi over q, and I'm left with q minus 2m. Sorry? Uh, <laughs> uh, th but did I do this right? Uh, the, pi the q's cancel top and bottom, and alpha is 2 pi q over m. Okay. So then this is uh, pi over q. I think this is a little bit nicer. Uh, I pi over q times q minus 2m. Put this even farther away so that I can do this. This is a finite sum. Ah, and now m does not run over q mod q. I have to be a little bit more careful. m runs from 0 to q because now there's an actual value of m here. So I can't, so it's it's in this branch cut calculation that I can't uh, change the value that where M runs. Okay, and it's not gonna be equal to zero because because there's a chi there. Okay, it's a finite sum. This we can actually compute. Um, so instead of a, an infinite series, that's what I'm what I'm trying to say. Instead of an infinite series, we can actually compute this thing. So let me give a little um, 
uh, again, in the interest of time, let me give a little exercise. This is something that's reported in many places, which is that if uh, chi is the real character, the Legendre symbol mod Q, and uh, Q is a prime that's three mod four, then actually Gauss computed exactly the value of this Gauss sum. And we know that its absolute value is root Q. What is the argument? It turns out the argument is I. So if we did, uh, for example, if we did seven, example, uh, Q equals seven, which is certainly a prime mod Q, then what is tau, uh, then what is, um, so chi, here's n and here's chi, and one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven of course is zero, of one is one, uh, what are the squares? Two squared is four, three squared is nine, nine is two, those are squares, um, four squared is negative three squared. It's like a mirror, right? It's Once a, you go through the first exactly. three, then you're done. Exactly, so I have three squares, that means the other three are non-squares. Okay, and so if you add up, if you add up what is tau of chi, it's one times e to the two pi i over seven times one plus e to the uh, two pi i over seven times uh, two minus, now this minus sign, e to e seven of three plus e seven of four uh, minus e seven of five minus e seven of six. And I'll let you do this calculation to see that this comes out to i times root seven. So it's like the issue that whether minus one is a square or not, is that like a, because it, it isn't a square here, but if you were one mod four, then it would be a square. And then tau would be just root q and not i root q. This is all intimately related to, yeah, let's notice that chi of minus one. Right, right chi of minus one, uh, in this case, I mean, it's, it's one or negative one, depending on if Q is one mod four or three mod four. So, so in this case, uh, it's minus one, if Q is three mod four, right? Right, because minus one is not a square. Uh, this number is not a sum of, a, a prime that's three mod four is not a sum of two squares. We're going all the way back to Fermat, okay? All right, so with this extra piece of information, which I'll leave to you to calculate. So this is, this is also an exercise. Uh, exercise, just direct computation. Um, you know, you, you can draw these things on the unit circle. Okay, I won't do the, I always do the exercises for you. Wait, you just, would it not be a direct computation for one mod four? It would be, for, for a particular value, you mean? Yeah. So for a particular value, it's always a direct computation like this. You're just adding up a bunch of things of the, uh, of, on the unit circle and seeing which way. So for example, you can already see that this guy and this guy, so e to the minus, oh, let me try. No, I'm not gonna do the exercise for you. <laughs> exercise. I, I'm just a little confused about why we're specializing for the three mod four. Just to, just to show you an exact calculation. Oh, one exact model. Like yeah, I, I wanna get, uh, I don't know what the answer, I'm Dirichlet. Right, I don't right. know the class number formula yet because I haven't discovered it. But I'm, but I'm just following my notes. What can I learn? Gauss already knew this. So let's use that information. So again, if Q, so let's specialize to Q being three mod four. Now I have L of one chi is minus chi of negative one. So there's a minus chi of negative one, which we know is negative one. Tau is I times root Q over Q. So using this for tau, a sum as m ranges from zero to q, chi of m bar, but chi is real now. And then this log thing, so there's a log, and then log dot 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 plus i pi over q. Um, by the way, there's one more thing we can do here. This q is a, this q does not have an m in it. So this is a constant. And it's a constant getting multiplied by chi and sum. So I can actually kill the, that Q because the sum of chi vanishes. Oh, I see. 
So now I have a minus two pi q m. I mean, that holds in general, right? That holds in general. Yeah. Okay. That holds in general. Yeah. But I know that this is summing real things. So this is a real number. This is equal to his real part. Complex part has to die out. The complex part has to die out. Everything here is real except this I and that I. Oh, wait. So, so the log has the to die. The log has to die out, yeah. And now look at what we have. Minus, minus, and two I's is minus. So that's three minuses. I have a one over root Q. That, that's why for one lot four is more complicated, right? Because you have to look at the other guy. Not exactly. The other. That's where the logs are going to come for one mod four. It's from this term. But like, why are there cases in the yes. last number formula? Exactly for this reason. It's because because the value of, of tau. Um, and then what do I have here? Pi over q. So I can pull that pi over q out. In fact, I'll put the pi here, but the one over q I'll put here for a structural reason. And then I just have a sum as m goes from zero to q. And it's really zero to q because these are actual values, chi of m times m. Okay, so you pulled everything else. I pulled, a, oh, I, did I drop a two? So I have two pi, i squared times minus one times minus one is just a single minus one. There's a root q over q, which is a one over root q. There's a one over q, which I want to group with this sum to make it like an average, and chi of m times m. Yes. And the bar was dropped here. because chi is real. I see. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Um, okay. So, question: How um, how do we get something explicit out of this? Well, now now take uh, now take uh, let's do our favorite example of q equals seven. Sorry, Nick, you were saying something. Okay, so l of one chi seven is let's see negative two pi over root q. Oh, was there an over two? Am I missing an over two? Pi minus alpha over two. Mm. Oh, did that not get carried around? Yeah. I think I, I dropped the two. Okay. I and wanted to have, cancels that cancels out this two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And that cancels out that two. That I knew I didn't want a two there. As you'll see in a second, why? Pi over root Q. And then, uh, so root Q is seven. Pi over root seven. 1 over 7 times a sum of chi of m times m. But we know what chi is. Chi is 1, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. So that's 1 times 1 plus 1 times 2, m is 2, minus 1 times 3, plus 1 times 4, minus 1 times 5, minus 1 times 6. And that's it. This is a number. 2 and 4 minus 6 is 0. This is negative eight plus one is negative seven. So, yeah. so there is your pi over root seven. And that is what I claimed for the series one over one plus one over two minus one over three plus one over four minus one over five minus one over six plus zero over seven and so on. And it's like, just wondering how do you, I guess in the, in the class number formula, right, you don't have to deal with these finite. I guess like it, it's not written with this finite. That's sum, right. We have to turn the, the final stage is to turn to reinterpret this as a class number, is to recognize exactly, this as right? a class number. Yeah. So, I'm about to say, you know, if you have to, right, yeah. So, so Dirichlet, I think, computed a bunch of these examples. Gauss had already computed tons of tables of class numbers. Because what Dirichlet observed is that he was getting a number here. This was turning out to be a number. It's turning out to be a whole number. He didn't know why. And it was turning out to be a number that he pattern matched. My guess is that he pattern matched. Gauss's table? Yes, my guess, my guess, my uneducated guess is that Dirichlet computed a ton of these. You see, it's not, it's not that hard. You just do it. Computed a ton of these. 
and uh, saw a pattern, uh, noticed a pattern with Gauss's tables. Like, how did he have access to Gauss's tables, though? Well, he was the Gauss chair at Göttingen. He just like a. Didn't this work in the Gauss chair? Sorry? Didn't this work in the Gauss chair? Or was he already the Gauss chair? Oh, yeah, good question. Uh, Anyway, he, he was certainly well aware of Gauss's work. I mean, Gauss was, you know, a, a sort of a towering figure in this. This is, uh, we're talking about 1830s. Gauss is in 18, in 1797 is world famous for making a 17 uh, I was just wondering if he had to like uh, make the tables himself knowing that Gauss had computed them or did he have access directly to Gauss's tables? Oh, uh, my guess is there were libraries where Gauss's tables were reproduced and, and published and so on. Again, the astronomical calculations too and tables of that. Yes, yes. So, so let me give you another exercise. Exercise, uh, compute L1 chi, let's see, what's a prime that's three mod four? 23, I think. And you will find pi over root 23 same as same as this pi over root seven, except this sum, this big sum here for the character mod twenty three comes out to three, not one. And that is because the class number of minus twenty three is three. So I have to explain what this is. I haven't explained anything about this. That's our next. Our next stop is class numbers, and uh, so we have this like large recursion. We want Dirichlet's theorem on primes and progressions. Uh, that gets us to L functions, that gets us to real L functions, that gets us to class number problem. We have to refer us back to uh, gas. Yes. Left What's left to prove for uh, What's left to prove is that all of these things are non zero. Let's see. Okay. So the way we're going to prove that they're non zero is we'll evaluate them exactly. Awesome. And we'll see just <laughs> that, the, that the value is actually not zero. Class number. Okay. And it's just sort of like we're taking this. Sort of strange finite sum, and we're tying it to an object. Yes. Right. That's sort of like what we're doing. Yes. So that like it's not like some abstract sum anymore. It's something else. It's some other. I mean, <laughs> it's a finite computation. The question is, do these? You see, we're not done yet because do these? Uh, so to exactly to Nick's point, uh, can the, this sum ever vanish? But it's like once you know it's the class number sort of thing, then it's easy to know it doesn't. Right? Exactly. And that's like the, it's just like tying it is incredible. Right. 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 For uh, primes and progressions. Yes. That's why it's such a great story. That's why I love this story. Yes, it is it's very wild. Wait. Okay. We have this alternating sum. And what was like, not rigorous about what was going on? before you mean just the interchanges of yeah but that's fine that's really it's really fun oh okay so what you guys are saying is if you look at it just a bit more closely yes it's fine to justify the uh, going from top to the bottom line will be fine but when you're to the bottom and you see the thing converts then you just go up yes uh, oh what are you calling um oh you're saying it might not be fine but then you evaluate it I mean, if it's finite, yes. the ones on the right converts, yes. then the sum can actually be right, right, yes. right, right. I noticed that m equals zero is not one of the sums here. So you're not ever evaluating one over n. Okay, so that's why we have to be careful to take out. You, you, you can put them back in when they don't matter, but you have to make sure to take them out when, when it doesn't matter for them not to be there. Okay. For the for so the it's not that there are any issues. It's just that There's no issue. Talk about it at the moment. Yes. So, okay. Okay, so we need we need now to understand uh, Gauss's theory uh, of binary quadratic forms. But Gauss, uh, uh, and really, I mean, for some uh, some reason, uh, Legendre gets a no, no, gets gets lost. He should be attributed to this because he did a lot of the, the work before Gauss. Uh, but people, you know, Gauss is so. Uh, such a towering figure, he towers over the time. Legendre was definitely uh, uh, involved in all of this. What Legendre didn't know is the uh, group structure is to give a class group to classes of binary vector, that there's a composition law. Um, right. And Gauss you know, really chugged through that complicated 
Thank you. Which it turns out, well, maybe we'll do bar. Uh, I'll do. Uh, I'll do bar. Bar. Uh, uh, they got some cubes. Like, said, uh, exactly. Recently. Yeah. Uh, the composition law, but we don't actually need the composition law for what we're doing for our for our immediate purposes. I know we're doing a lot of other things. Well, yeah. Anyway, so uh, what what's the idea? The idea is we're going to start all the way back at Fermat. Fermat, by the way, I think this is 1637, which would be amazing because if you recall, 1737 is when Euler proves the summary of circles of the primes. Oh. <laughs> 1837 is when Dirichlet proves primes and progressions, and, and 1937 is Vinogradov, uh, Ternary Goldbach. So uh, I think we I think we can add one more year to that. So 2037, 2037 is going to be. Has to be good, right? It'll be amazing. <laughs> um, okay, so so Fermat tells you exactly which numbers are like what numbers answers what numbers are represented by the the quadratic form the quadratic form x squared plus y squared. Okay, so this is a quadratic form q of x y homogeneous polynomial binary binary, two variable homogeneous polynomial um, with coefficients in the integers. Uh, and we know the answer, it's all the numbers that are one mod four and not three mod four for the primes and then multiply it. Um, uh, for other forms, for some other forms, this was answered. In fact, there's a, there's a great book, uh, read for the full story of this, or at least as much of the story as we currently understand, read Cox, primes of the form x squared plus n y squared. So there's a special uh, special case. But so the question became, given a binary quadratic form over the integers, what can you say about what numbers are represented? OK, which so more generally, the general question is which n's are represented by q, which I'll write as a, b, c. ABC means AX squared plus BXY plus CY squared. Okay, you give me uh, 101, that's Fermat. You give me uh, 10N, that's this book. So there's a, there's a long story here. And then in general, what's, what's going on? And a simple observation, observation is that uh, if you make a change of variables, so if if you define Q prime of X and Y to be Q of, let's call it alpha X plus beta Y, uh, let's just call them ABC, uh, AX plus BY, CX plus DY, with ABCD invertible, uh, if this is an invertible over Z linear transformation, if this is an invertible, over Z uh, linear transformation. In other words, uh, you replace X and Y by uh, AX plus BY CX plus DY. Well, that's just multiplying by a matrix. A, is it A, B, C, D? Did I get this right? I think I did. Usually I get it somehow, some fast <laughs> acronyms, uh, but I actually got it right this time. If you replace uh, xy by abcd xy, um, and this is invertible, uh, this represents the same numbers. This represents represents the same. So in other words, then then q prime represents the same numbers as q. So we will call them equivalent. So what does it mean to be invertible over these linear transformations? That means this matrix is in GL2Z. Okay, now I will want equivalence for uh, technical reasons. Uh, let's call this equivalence, uh, narrow equivalence. So um, pr uh, proper equivalence. Yes, Q. So we will say definition Q and Q prime are properly equivalent. Properly. And he also doesn't do this, right? He uh, stays in the bug. Case. So Gauss's treatment is complicated by the fact that he puts a two here. 
Right, right. So this is classically integral as opposed to integral. And that just sort of and mixes up the numbers all of it, right? <laughs> yes. And he studies, uh, it, it's a little complicated. So <laughs> instead of, there's like, you could have integral or classical integrality. You could have wide equivalence or proper equivalence, narrow class group or the wide class group. Uh, let's just stick to one of them and try to understand it in detail. And then you'll understand what the general picture looks like. It's just a simple you know, modification. I mean, anyhow, with this, we can settle the other thing. Right? Exactly. So that, that's good enough. Exactly. Me. These are probably equivalent if uh, ABCD is in SLT. Okay. Now, um, there's a fundamental uh, difference between forms. Ah, so here's a little exercise. Trivial exercise. Uh, the discriminant is an in, in invariant. So if let, let D of Q be, if Q is ABC, then this is B squared minus 4AC. And you see why if B was even, then it would just be B squared minus AC mm -hmm. with this factor of four that you could universally pull out. But anyway, um, let D be the discriminant, then uh, Q is equivalent to Q prime implies D of Q is equal to D of Q prime. The discriminant is in the variant. Yeah, it's a trivial exercise. Um, uh, is the converse true? <laughs> is the converse true? Class number four. <laughs> exactly. If the discriminants are equal, does it imply that the forms are equal? This still blows my mind. You know, the, it's right, fine. It, it's it's not true, but finite is a right incredible. <laughs> right. Right. And again, it's Legendre that sort of uh, really pioneered this way of thinking, and then Gauss took it to a whole new level. So, so people call it the Gauss uh, Gauss's theory of quadratic forms. Um, we should give credit for credit. Okay. So uh, let um, how should I notate this bracket of Q be the forms equivalent to Q. So Q prime. Uh, all the forms equivalent to Q instead of all forms equivalent to Q, you know, up to equivalence. Um, you, you see what I mean? The be the be the class, yeah. be the class of equivalence class of of the quadratic form Q, um, and let uh, C D be the set of all classes classes of forms. Same whose same. discriminant is equal to this number D that's given. Congress were true, then this would be full of- Then this would be a singleton, right? exactly, exactly. Uh, and uh, theorem, I guess I should put both Legendre and Gauss, <laughs> is uh, this, the size of this thing, which is called the class number, is fine. Okay. And it's a very simple theorem. It's a, uh, you know, I'm, should I even do H of D? Yes, H of D is the definition of the size of the, the class group. Um, because it's called the class group. Class group. I have to, I have to uh, put group in quotation since I'm not justifying the use of the word in the sense of, of being a group. But there is a group structure, there's a composition law. Uh, which uh, is, is an abelian group structure. You can add uh, classes and get new classes, and you can invert classes this, or, and get the identity class. Does this like arise more organically viewing this algebraically? As in like, uh... Uh, well, when you go to the Edel class group, uh, yes. So you, so you have like these Vedican domain things, and then like... Yes, this is the classical uh, picture from which uh, we, when you we, when you reinterpret this, uh, you know, as uh, as a statement in algebraic number theory, then it's just a lot of things become easier when you uh, build up the technology. Right, right, right. That's, uh, so maybe we maybe we will. I was going to try to do things classically, um, 
what is so, the identity class? The identity class, it turns out, is uh, so if um, well, it's it's this. Uh, I'll show you what the identity class is in a second. Um, yeah, I'll show you what the identity class is in a second. It's, it, it is something that's very simple that you can write down. It's that if D is, okay, we'll, we'll get to what the, what discriminants can be. So we're originally calling this class group because Gauss discovered this sort of complicated law to like- The group um, structure, yes. To do this. And what you're saying is that when you right, synthetically make this algebraic framework, then it's just a lot easier to see this. The group structure is, is uh, immediate. Once you set everything up. Yes. Okay. Cool. But the conversion between classes and, uh, you know, Udell classes. Oh, hang on. Okay. So each C sub D is a group. Each C sub oh, okay. D. I thought the C sub Ds were elements in it. I was confused. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I each uh, fixed D. I understand now. Okay. This so is the some, dth class group. So you somehow have to compose them, right? That's the, uh, <laughs> exactly. There's a way of getting, taking a class and another class with the same discriminant and coming up with yet another class of the same discriminant. How did Kels introduce that? It is absolute genius. That is insane. Uh, all right. So maybe I will, maybe I will do the, uh, the group structure if you guys are, are really curious. Um, and this is called the class number. Class number. H of D. Uh, okay, just very quickly, let's recall the proof. So there are two, yeah, okay, so um, I should say, uh, note, note, if D is a, uh, is of the form B squared minus four AC, then uh, if you look mod four, D is a square mod four then D is a square mod four. And the only squares mod four, which implies D is equal to zero or uh, one. Um, so, so uh, mod, four. mod four, yes, zero or one mod four. So when I say the class number is always non-zero, it's for anything that is a discriminant, anything that can be expressed in this way, okay. And uh, there's a big difference, big difference geometrically between uh, D being positive and D being negative. Of course, D equals zero. What happens if the discriminant is zero? Why? Um, right, because you're gonna have, uh, it's gonna factor. Exactly. Then Q factors, like if you take uh, Q to be, uh, I don't know, X plus Y times X minus Y. And it's kind of trivial to know what numbers are represented. Exactly. The numbers represented are, are just uh, whatever the prime factorization is, that's the product structure. And then right. not an done. interesting question like the other one. Right. So. Right. Uh, so we. So we'll separate out that case as well. But the difference between D being positive and D being negative is that if D is positive, if D is positive, then uh, again, what is Q? Q, Q of X, Y, we have some A X squared plus B X, Y plus C, Y squared. Well, um, let's let, in general, let's let alpha Q be the root uh, negative B plus root D over two A. So this is a root in the sense that Q of alpha Q uh, comma, um, if I set Y equal to one, this will be zero. This is a root. If I set Y to be one, then I just have a quadratic polynomial. Then I'm just applying the quadratic formula. So this alpha uh, Q uh, is, is some number. And so Q is equal to A of X, let's see, minus alpha Q Y, I think that's right, and x minus alpha q bar y. And when you multiply this out, q bar being the uh, Gawa conjugate, because d could be positive or d could be negative. Okay, so when you multiply this out, you get you get back to uh, all of this. And then the d positive case is where you get some really nice hyperbolic geometry 
In either case, you get nice hyperbolic geometry. But this one's even more complicated, right? So, so the... if the discriminant is positive, then um, then if you look at uh, look over R, not over Z, but over R, what can you say about the uh, the equation? You know, Z, which numbers are are represented by Q, X, Y? Well, for any such value. We can always for any for any z we can we can set y equal to one, and uh, and we can solve because the, the discriminant is positive, so there are solutions for any value of z. So over r, uh, q of x y takes both uh, positive and negative values, and. Um, and so uh, we call this uh, indefinite. It doesn't take one value or the other. Okay. So this is if D is positive. If D is negative, so an example of this is x squared minus y squared. Again, this is one that factors. Uh, darn. I, uh, B squared, let's see, B squared minus 4AC, A is one and c is negative one so the discriminant is um the discriminant is four which is positive so what am i saying uh i don't want d to be a perfect square not only do i not want it to be zero yeah, i also don't want it to be a perfect square because then it's still all factors over q factors over q so d equals zero or d is a perfect square then it might factor over Q. So this does factor over Q. If D is negative, uh, for example, Q of XY is X squared uh, plus Y squared, this only takes the sums of two squares are positive. Okay, this takes either takes only one sign. Near the Discriminants in the complex plane already, right? right. It makes the geometry easier. Exactly. So, so here, this is the case where alpha is real. Alpha Q is real. Here, alpha Q is in the upper half plane if the discriminant is negative. Okay, so this is definite, which could be positive definite or negative definite, depending on the, the sign of uh, you know, the leading coefficient. Okay, so far so good. So there's going to be, we can, I mean, there is a common proof that doesn't think about complex, uh, uh, the complex plane. I mean, if you don't want to do this, you can always uh, refer to the thin orbits. Paper, sure. Guess, and then it's sort of outlined. Sure, yeah, it is, it's all there. Uh, it, it's easy enough to, to very quickly, uh, very quickly touch this. So, um, so very quickly. Uh, so I mean, three to equal to one is pretty easy, right? You can just explicitly give the quadratic forms uh, with D for, for one mod four and zero mod four. Sorry, say it again. If, so if D is like, positive. Like the class number, you want it to be greater or equal to one, right? So that part, you can like literally give explicit examples of quadratic forms. Yes, but I want to uh, I, I want to explain how you would do the pattern matching. So to do the pattern matching, I want you to be able to compute class numbers. How do you actually compute a class number, right? I, I told you, I mean, the theorem that I'm trying to prove is that this thing is finite, but how do you actually compute it? I told you that this, uh, uh, what's this example? Negative 23, I told you this class number of negative 23 is three. Why? How do you, how do you figure that out? How do you work that out? Um, so, uh, so let's. Just, I, you guys probably all, Nick, have you seen this before? Long time ago. Okay, good. Good, perfect. All right, so I'm not boring all of you. Okay, so if D is negative, if D is negative, let's think about this. So D is negative. So alpha Q is somewhere over here. It's somewhere in the upper half plane. Oh. It's because X Q minus X minus one has degree three. Do I have my volume on? Sorry, George, can you, did you say something?
Um, sorry, yeah, no, I was just kind of giving like the most complicated possible proof for why it would be equal to three, just, just to be uh, facetious. Uh, for why it would be equal to why H, why the yeah, class number of negative 23 would be equal to three? Yeah, because that you can like actually, the, this has like discriminant negative 23 and it's unramified. And then so that ah. means that. <laughs> nice. I like it. I like it. Um, okay. So, uh, so the, the proof is by reduction theory. So, the, so the proof proof that uh, the class number is, is finite is by reduction theory. So uh, if you take any Q, take any Q. So it has this alpha Q, let's say the discriminant is negative. Um, if you change, if you replace Q by some Q tilde, which is Q composed with some matrix in SL2Z, um, then alpha of Q prime will be the alpha of Q acted on by, is it gamma or gamma transpose or gamma transpose inverse? I'll, I'll write gamma, but I'll, but I'll have you uh, check. So check, yeah, is it gamma inverse? Doesn't matter what it is since it's a group. Um, this includes integer translations, right? So, yeah. No, I'm just saying, like, yeah, you're sort of doing the fundamental domain. Exactly. Kind of exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, what does this mean? Uh, that means, oh, yeah. So, um, what am I trying to say here? This thing moves and, uh, and it moves by SL2Z. And SL2Z, so uh, a fundamental domain, fundamental domain for the action. I thought I had something else I wanted to say. Maybe it'll come back to me uh, before I got to fundamental domains for action. Oh, I wanted to say what this what this action is. I didn't define, that's, what, that's what's bothering me. I didn't define what this fractional oh. linear transformation is. <laughs> ABCD acting on alpha is uh, the fractional linear map, A, alpha plus B over C alpha plus D, which is really the linear map on projective space. This is really just a little aside. Aside, the projective space is, is pairs of points, alpha, alpha, beta, modulo the equivalence uh, that um, alpha, beta is equivalent to lambda alpha, lambda beta. So this is the projective line which you can think of, if beta is not equal to zero, then you can divide by beta. You can take lambda to be one over beta. So it's equal to alpha one, the set of all these things. Union, if beta is equal to zero, I can divide by alpha. Union one, zero. So this is the point at infinity. This is the affine line and the point at infinity. Um, and then the fractional linear action, this fractional linear action, so fractional linear action is nothing but the linear action on projective space. This is the linear action on T1. Why? Well, what am I doing? What am I doing if I take A, B, C, D, and I take some, some vector alpha beta, which is really some vector, let's say alpha one, I can rescale to make, to make uh, beta one. So let's rescale to make beta one. This is a, uh, a, uh, a alpha plus B times one in the first coordinate. In the second coordinate, it's C alpha plus D. And then I can, which is, which is uh, projectively equivalent to the fractional linear on top, C alpha plus D and one on the bottom. Okay, so this, so this operation is really something that should be, should be happening in projective space, but, uh, but we'll, we'll make it not act in projective space by adjoining the point at infinity implicitly in the sense that if, uh, if the denominator is zero, then we call this the point at infinity. Okay, so that's where fractional linear transformations come from. They're really uh, linear maps in, on, projective, on the projective line. Um, so what's the fundamental domain for this 
fraction and linear action uh, of SL2Z on upper half plane. Um, so uh, again, what you can do is you can take the entire orbit, let alpha be any point, and let's call this gamma. We take the whole orbit gamma alpha. And um, so I have all these points. I don't know where they are. They're all translates. This is a discrete action. Action is discrete. Action is discrete. Uh, well, not only is so it's uh, some people like to call this discontinuous. So discontinuous is that for any compact, for any pair of compact sets, K1, K2, uh, compact. Yes, the set of gamma in gamma, so that gamma K1 intersect K2 is non empty, is finite. In a general setting, these aren't equivalent, right? Um, discrete and discontinuous. In, yeah, in, in really weird uh, settings. For us, so here there will, they will be uh, one and the same. Um, so uh, so very quickly, we, what we can do is we can take the, um, among all alpha, we can maximize the, the height. So uh, the, we can maximize the height, uh, the imaginary part of gamma alpha. And among all those, we can minimize the real part. And among those, among these, among these, minimize the real part. And when you do that, you, you observe that if you are outside of this uh, region here, so this is between minus a half and a half in the real part and outside of the unit circle, then uh, either you could, if, if you are outside of it for, uh, for one of two reasons, you could be outside of it because your real part is, is outside of it, or you could be outside of it because your absolute value is inside the unit circle instead of being outside. And um, you can always increase either the, the imaginary part or the real part. Um, I'm, I'm trying to rush through this argument since all of you have seen it, but uh, Nick. Yeah, I've seen, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's in the course of course. Yeah. All right, I guess later. The key thing is right the this since the action is discontinuous, discontinuous, but if you keep going in the unit circle, you're not going to like uh, end up at a, some sort of limiting point. Right? Exactly. You're going to you eventually will bump up into exactly exactly. So, so this is kind of a uh, this is a theoretical way to do this, but the practical way to do this is, of course, you take alpha, whatever it is, translate you translate, translate exactly, you apply one n zero one to alpha, which is just translating. So wherever your alpha was, if your alpha was, if your alpha was up here, then, then you can translate and make the real part between minus a half and a half to make, to make real part between minus a half and a half. And if you wind up in this part, somewhere, you invert if, if uh, the absolute value is now less than one, apply, apply the elements. This is usually called, well, the, with a one there, it's usually called T, apply the element called S, which is one, negative one, uh, zero, one, negative one, zero. And this sends uh, Z to one over negative Z, so negative one over Z, increases its which increases its imaginary part. So if you if you had a point here, it inverts in the unit circle and inverts in across the y-axis. So it actually sends it to somewhere here. This increases increases the imaginary part. Okay, but then you would uh, you would apply this uh, translation again. So you would apply the translation again, and uh, if you never got out, so you can always get it inside minus a half a half in the real part. If you never got outside of uh, this unit circle. If you never found a point here, then uh, you would have infinitely many orbits of a point inside of a compact region. Okay. So anyway, that was a, a, a very fast uh, treatment of this fundamental domain. What it means, since we can always uh, reduce somebody there, and of course, then you have to argue that that reduction is uh, the two points inside the domain. Let me leave this as a, as a simple exercise. 
Um, oh, there's something funny. Now let me let me do it as a simple exercise. Uh, if uh, if no, there's a funny thing. So when we coded this up in Lean. We discovered a way of doing it, which is not in any book that I'm aware of. Um, for simplicity in lean? For simplicity in lean. Interesting. Uh, which maybe I should show you guys. <laughs> well, no, let me not do it now in the interest of time, but maybe I will make a note to show, show this uh, identity, show lean identity. You should run some sort of lean class or something like that. That we might do uh, anyway. So if, if both of these are in the open fundamental domain, so, so, there's, so we have this fundamental domain F, which is a set of Z uh, in the upper half plane with uh, absolute value of Z greater than one and real part of Z less than one, less than a half. So this is an open domain. So what this, what this argument shows is that you can move anything into the closure of this domain. And if you have two things in the open domain, uh, and and uh, gamma z is equal to z prime, then uh, z is equal to z prime. Well, and gamma is equal to, and gamma is equal to the identity in PSL to z, not SL to z. This is true in PSL to. Okay, fine. So the point is, I really want to compute the class number of minus twenty three. Uh, <laughs> How do you, so, so, so what do you do? Um, why is, why is the class number finite? This is still D being negative. Now this is not that, right? Like once you're in the fundamental domain, then it's like. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a simple argument. Um, why is this not, not negative? Why is this finite? <laughs> if the class number is negative, why is the class? If the discriminant is negative, I'll slow down and try to say the words I need to say. If the discriminant is negative, why is the class number finite? Um, so let's remember what this alpha Q is. So any, any Q, any class Q has a representative, has representative Q with, with alpha Q in this fundamental domain. And what is the class? Well, the this this number is negative b plus root d over two a, and it has to have absolute value. What does it mean to be in the domain? The absolute value of negative b plus root d over two a has to be bigger than one. Uh, yes. And the real part of negative b over two a, the real this is imaginary. Right. So the real part of this thing in absolute value is less than, so it's not the real part anymore, it's just the absolute value is less than a half. Yeah. Okay, so this is easy. Uh, this means that B in absolute value is between, uh, I'll assume A is, is uh, positive. You go up to a negative sign, you can always do that. Yep. Um, then uh, B is between, so these, so B is between, uh, B is between A and negative A. And what does this say? So if I multiply through by 2a, so what is the absolute value of this? It's negative b, um, it's b squared. This is a complex number. So it times it's conjugated will be a minus sign, minus the absolute value of d. But what is the absolute value of d? It's uh, d is negative. So this is b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Needs to be bigger than 1. So if I cancel the b squares, I get four ac is bigger than one. That means that, uh, that means that, what? Um, what am I trying to do here? You have to square the two away, right? Thank you very much. Yeah. That's what I'm missing. Yeah. And make that a four. Yeah. Good, yeah. good. Yeah. The a's can't totally cancel out. That would be <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so c over a is bigger than one. Some, something's a little funny here. Uh, oh, it's not this. So if we squared the negative b plus root d over 2a, 
Yes. Uh, so this absolute value, let's let's do this again. Uh, let me put an absolute value of D times an I. Right, okay. So its norm is B squared, minus, yeah, times the conjugate, so minus the absolute value of discriminant. But the absolute the D parts the okay. Yeah. Um what I want to get is something like A has to be less than root D. Uh, where am I supposed to get that from? The real part is not going to see D at all. This will. Um, I mean, maybe you're not going to want to expand ah, the, forget the B, right? Just forget the B. Just forget the B. Uh, the absolute value of this number is at least the absolute value of root D over 2A. There we go. So that tells us that A is bounded above by 2D. So there's finitely many A's, there's finitely many B's. And once A and B is fixed, then, then C is determined. Isn't that negative all going the other way? Sorry? D over two. Uh, D over two, thanks. D over two. Even better. No, it's a small side. I multiply A over there, and A is less than root D over two. Okay, so finally, so given D, in summary, given D, there's finitely many A's, finitely many values of A. I already said A is positive. Given that bound on for each A, there's finitely many B's. And given A and B and D, and C is determined by D is equal to B squared minus 4AC, if it exists. Yeah, that's good enough to... So that's it. So the class number is fine. Okay, my, my, D uh, is negative. missing something. That inequality up there, not like uh, the other one. Ah, uh, right. Okay, so what do I want to say? It's that, it's that this thing is at most... I want to make this bigger. Let's see, just a second. You just have to like compare one to the other, right? Ah, uh, B is less than two A. So, B, so this thing is at most one. So if I add another root D here, I want to make this bigger. I want to make this bigger. Oh God, should have thought about this instead of just swinging it. Um, <laughs> See, usually just winging it comes out better than if I think about it. Uh, yeah, but in this case, it's always like tricky what, inequality. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's not that tricky. I'm just missing something stupid about like the size of B versus the size of, yeah. of this. I should get a bound like um, this thing is at least, the discriminant should be at least uh, if I'm subtracting 4AC. All right. Problem? The problem is that this inequality is wrong. Oh. I'm dropping the real part. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm pulling it to the, I'm getting closer to one than far, uh, closer to zero than, rather than farther from zero. Um, and I want to use this inequality. So I think that's where this a third, in my memory, there's, you can get a, a factor of three out of here. And then you get a bound like this. But um, yeah. I mean, like in your paper, it's, yeah, yeah, it's all worked okay. out there. Yeah. Okay, so let's fix this next time. Yeah, Let me very quickly. It's very simple. It's just that you have to look at it the right way. Right? Exactly. Let me very quickly uh, show what you do in the positive discriminant. Oh, should I do the positive discriminant very quickly, or should I, uh, using this, compute h of my negative 23? Let's just see how this works for negative 23. Yeah, I think that. Um... So example, example, D is equal to negative 23. Negative 23 is indeed one mod four. So I wanna know how to solve, uh, how to solve, you know, negative 23 is equal to B squared minus four AC in this, in this region. So uh, A will range up to, so what is root D? Root D is like, this is less than 25. So this is less than five and five over three is less than one. So in fact, my options for A. Uh, less than two is the median. Less strictly than, less than two. Strictly less than two. 
which means a is at most one. Okay, so a that's too few options. Sorry. Oh, because uh, I put the over three. Okay. This should be okay. So maybe it's not over three. Ah, uh, maybe it's. Well, let's just call it root d. Ah. Let's just call it root d. So let's say so. This is less than five. Okay. So so these are the values of a that we have to try. So we have to try a equals one. Uh, a equals two. A equals three and a equals four. And a equals one, the values of b, b can be negative one, zero, or one. Here, there's a, there's a longer range, and here there's an even longer range. If, if a is one and b is negative one, I'm trying to solve negative 23 is equal to negative one squared. So let's, let's do this one. Negative one squared is just one minus four times a times c. In other words, let's solve for C just so that we have it sitting here. If I move this to that side, that to that side, this is B squared minus D over 4A. Mm -hmm. So B squared minus D has to be divided by 4 and by A. That gives us very limited possible values for B. Uh, so do we get a solution in this case? Uh, B is 1, 1 minus D is 24. So C is 6. So in this case, C is... Uh, equal to six. If B is zero, then there's not, then D is not divisible by, by four. And if B is one, uh, I also get six for the same reason. So for B positive and negative, they come in pairs. Um, they do come in pairs, but some of them might be equivalent or inequivalent. You have to check if these are on the boundary. Uh, which we'll, which we'll check in a second. So, so this again gives us C equals six. All right, I'm, uh, maybe the, the clock will have mercy on me. Uh, and check the rest and, and yeah, all right. Let me actually uh, prepare this calculation and, and you'll see this and I'll also show you how to do it in lean. And I owe you, owe you what happens if uh, the discriminant is indefinite if the quadratic form is indefinite this room is positive and since you then you're on the real line continue fraction, right? and then you do continue fractions instead yeah.